Hey there, thanks for joining CED at this exciting session today with Todd Olson, co-founder and CEO of Pendo, who shares his perspective and management approach to the product-led organization featured in his new book. Interviewing him is Polina Marinova, owner of the popular newsletter, The Profile, who specializes in capturing these success stories of high-profile entrepreneurs, executives, and social change agents. On behalf of CED, it's our pleasure to bring you valuable content that will expand your perspective and give you the tools that you need to build exceptional companies. We hope you enjoy this fireside chat. Um, give us a quick um, snippet of your background and what led you to found Pendo. Yeah, so my background, um, you know, I'm a software developer. So I started developing when I was 14 years old, working uh, actually in banks of all things. And I've been a, and started my first company at 20, uh, right as my senior year in college. So I'm kind of a builder, entrepreneur, uh, been a CTO, been a chief product officer. And, you know, my passion is kind of marrying technology with business problems. That's kind mm -hmm. of what I've done. And, and my last company, was a, was a SaaS or cloud company, whatever people like to call them. And I struggled to have good insights in how people were using it and kind of understanding where to take the strategic direction of it. And I tried to build some internal tools to capture data and drive engagement. And it was hard, it was really, really hard. And um, after leaving, I was thinking what I wanted to do next. And um, kind of the idea for Pendo came to me very quickly. And I was like, okay, I'll take a break on it. And, like really think about it to make sure I want to invest the next, you know, n number of years of, in this idea and started developing a lot of conviction around it and kind of took off from there. But it's just basically a pain that I experienced myself in my prior company and that led to the formation of Pendo. Cool. So you wrote an entire book <laughs> kind of talking about that, uh, that pain and how to solve it. Um, the book, for those of you who haven't read it, it's so incredibly practical. It, it, there's zero percent fluff in it. Um, it's kind of more of like a guidebook almost. Um, can you define for us what a product-led company entails? Yeah, absolutely. So um, and I think people, a number of people have heard the term kind of product-led growth, um, uh, and that's usually referring to the customer acquisition process and like some sort of trial and or conversion process. Um, I've kind of taken that idea and, and really expanded upon it because I think I think that's too narrow thinking in terms of what it means to use your product. But really what I define it as is putting product at the center of the entire customer experience. That's just part of the customer experience. It's the center of the customer experience. And how can every aspect of a business leverage the product to do their jobs more effectively? And one of the areas that, that I talk a lot about is how do we... Um, shift from human led activities to product led activities. So it's more of a that that evolution in the areas that are really good candidates or anything in your business that is high volume, low value. And mm -hmm. I use plenty of examples that you know, I, I recently used an example like the Amazon Go store is a fantastic example of product led business. Like it's cashierless. Like who needs a cashier in a convenience store? I mean, you're mm. walking in, you're grabbing some very simple item. They're just ringing you out. Like it is an amazing example of product led. So it's very, again, low, low value, high volume activities. So, so you just said uh, it's, it's putting the product at the center of the customer experience. What, what do companies normally put at the center of the customer experience? Well, I mean, I, I, I think they're often, um, we, we use this term hand holding or white glove uh, service. Um, I, I think you know very often we we um, we handhold our uh, customers. So they're putting humans at the center of the customer experience, bring sales, bring customer success, bring support. Mm. Um, you know, when you walk into a bank, they're trying to well, when you're able to walk into a bank, uh, <laughs> they they. Um, they often try to build relationships with you and the relationship became the center of the product. Uh, you know, in my mind, the customer experience and relationships matter, but a quality product matters a lot more than relationships. And specifically now we're obviously we're seeing that shift. It's kind of a, it's mandatory. It's not optional anymore, but I think uh, prior to this, you know, um, we, we saw some companies adopt that mindset. That's so interesting, especially during something like COVID where, yeah, those relationships kind of have to take a backseat. Um, you mentioned the Amazon Go store. What are other examples of really great product-led companies? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
let's see, where should I go? I mean, consumer ones are easy because everyone understands consumer led companies. So like I also talk about Peloton and what mm. an amazing you know, product led business. Like I've never talked to a human at Peloton. I, mean, I assume they have them, um, but I don't know them personally, but um, the product keeps me engaged and gets me back. It, it taps a little to my competitive spirit. It taps a little bit into my notion of community through hashtags and friends. Like when I, friend takes a class I'm like well, maybe I should take that class you know so like it it finds a way to get me back to the product and I keep using it and by keep using it they have opportunities to upsell me expand me continue to grow my relationship with them I mean I think Tesla's a really great example um you know I I uh it's a very product-led oriented I mean, the, the car is just amazing um trying to get a human on the phone basically impossible and sometimes frustrating um, but uh, the product's just so good, it doesn't really matter. You know, at the yeah. end of the day, um, you go online, like you order it, um, you know, even like the delivery process is a bit janky, you know. Um, but once you get in it and sit and start driving, you're like, okay, really all this matters, right? <laughs> so that's another great, I think, consumer oriented um, example. I think on the, the B2B side, example is a, I'd love to use, it's kind of an OG example, is Atlassian. Um, Last has always been a product-led business. And for folks who don't know, they do development tools, software, and you know, they're a large publicly traded company. Um, but they famously, when they went public, said they had no sales team. Well, that's not exactly true, but they're trying to get at that as a product-led experience. You download it, you play with it, like everything's through the product. And I think they've done a remarkable job scaling a large company that way. Yeah. So when you wrote your book, who is the target uh, reader of your book? Is it the entrepreneur? Is it a, a, an executive, the product manager? Who can get the most value out of this? Yeah, look, I, I think all those roles you mentioned are good, good targets. I think certainly an executive, but as you noticed, it's a, um, yeah, it's a practical, um, it's a practical book, you know, um, I think product managers, you know, I, I think there's a lot of stories it's very specific to product managers, but look, I, I think CEOs and entrepreneurs are, are great, are great targets. Many CEOs are product um, oriented humans anyway. So I, I think it's a, it's a great read. And look, I'm a, um, more of a steak person than a sizzle person. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to be, so that's what I like, I like, you know, it being a little more practical in that. In that yeah. Regard. Um, we have a question. Uh, how could a large industrial company B2B work on being a product led company? Okay. I, you know, I, I think start somewhere, you know, and, and you know, very often people say, well, does that mean I need to do a freemium model? No, obviously not. So that's one aspect of being product led, but look at, you know, like I, I went back to high volume, low value activity inside your business. And what can you, what can you automate or what can you improve? So um, service and support is an area where I go to pretty, pretty regularly, nearly every company has some notion of service or support. Things break, there are problems, people get confused. What are the most common reasons for that? What can we um, eliminate so that people can self-service? People want, actually people want self-service. No one wants to get frustrated and call a human and say, hey, you, this, this thing broke or like, no one wants that. Like that makes you feel stupid. So like we want experiences where we ourselves can solve our own problems and we feel smart. So try to find those types of scenarios. I think it's a, that, that to me is a great place to start. Yeah. So, okay. So let's say you're an entrepreneur or a CEO, you're building your team. What characteristics are necessary in choosing the people in selecting the people in your company that you want to cultivate a product led uh, approach? Yeah. Um, well, look, I mean, maybe this is a, maybe this is a cheat of an answer, but I mean, I'd certainly like when I'm creating a, a small company, I like entrepreneurial people in general, like all of our first sales reps were entrepreneurs. Mm, that's interesting. Stand, or they worked at some failed startup for six months. Like I want someone that's going to grind with me and like iterate, you know, and, and I think, but so then the question would be then, okay, what are the traits of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. you look for, I guess. So like curiosity, um, being able to handle rejection, um, you know, being able to be somewhat analytical and disciplined in how you treat experiments. I mean, I think, you know, um, I mean, those are the characteristics that are really important to me. I mean, um, I mean, it, one of the sections of the books around data, obviously I started an analytics company. I like data a lot. You know, I just, just on my board dig out for a, uh, a, a, 
Friday board meeting and I was texting one of my board members, it's 167 slides. And I was like giving him a hard time. He's like, let me digest it. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, enjoy digesting 167 slides. And he's like, you're an analytics company. You just like throwing a lot of data at us. And I do like it, it I geek out on it. Like I, I was trying to remove slides before I said, I like just, they all feel good to me. <laughs> I want them all. So, um, so those are the kind of people I look for. I want people like the like. Let's let's be in the box. Let's figure this out. So I, that's that's how that's how I build teams. That's cool. So um, in your book, you write that there's a difference between becoming a product led company and simply changing how you build products. Uh, you write it's a shift from thinking of your product as a thing you sell to a mindset where the product is a user's first moment of truth. Can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you think about yourself when you go use a product the first time, I mean, that's the experience. It can be magical. Like now it also can be pretty horrible, but like, it's not just like, oh, I bought this product from the company. It's that when you experience it, you begin to understand what they meant by building it, like what their point of view is, what their contribution is. Like, like, like we've all experienced certain products in our lives where we're like, wow, like this person you know, they're inside of my head and this is exactly what I wanted. They're anticipating my needs. That feels good. And I think, um, so it's not just something we sell. It, it is our company. Like, like the, the product itself is the business in many cases. Like, you know, early in my career, I said, we do two things. We build software and we sell software, but software is the business. I mean, mm. you know, and whatever product you sell, that is your business. You know, and it's whether experiencing like an amazing piece of clothing for the first time and be like, you know, uh, like I'm a big fan of local company, Raleigh Denim, you know, it's a really nice jean. And if you haven't worn that jean, you really don't experience it. And like, it's not just a product they sell, it's the company. Like you mm. put that jean on, it's like, okay, I understand them. You know, they're well-crafted. Um, so, I mean, I, that's kind of how I think about it. Maybe that's a little too qualitative, but that, that's kind of... Wait, that's interesting. So, so you're saying that the product is important, but the experience of getting that product and trying it on or whatever is just as important. Exactly, because it's, it's, it's the emotion that it engenders inside of the user, which creates this connection with the business. You know, one of the tagline we use is helping companies create products users love. There is a big distinction between love and just like something. If I say I just like something, I can probably leave it. If I love it, the probability I leave it's very, very low, right? And you think mm -hmm. about the products we all love in our lives, like, those are the companies that are doing well. Those are the My Instant Pot, let me tell you. <laughs> I love that thing. Instant Pot is a pretty, pretty awesome device. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a, a convert as well. So I, I love that, that device. That's really cool. Um, we have a question from Miller White. Um, last year, Pendo expanded to the UK with a sales office in London in the acquisition and expansion of receptive software in Sheffield. What has your experience been in setting up an operation overseas and in the UK in particular? That's great. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, when, when we opened a, we, we looked at um, a couple different cities for opening up an EMEA sales office. The traditional in, in our space and software, it's usually either London or Amsterdam are kind of the two top choices. And when I say top choices, you're trying to go places where other software companies are like you. So you basically can steal talent from these other companies. I mean, that's why you pick places that are about the same. Um, and honestly, London has a direct flight from Raleigh and Amsterdam didn't. So it made it a little bit of an easier choice. Um, uh, and um, then we bought Receptive kind of independently of that. And look, it's in Sheffield. I'd never been to Sheffield. Someone described it as the Pittsburgh of the UK. <laughs> um, I lived in Pittsburgh for years. I, I like Pittsburgh and it's got a cool gritty vibe and um, they've got good universities. We, we've been able to actually build up an engineering team. We've tripled the size of the Sheffield office. Um, it's been actually very, very positive. So um, I love our team over there and I'm you know, really excited about the, the, the future of our, our UK team. Well, another question. Lots of tech companies have self-service centers, Apple, for example, but they suck. It's a very structured approach and only anticipates basic, easy questions. How can companies that have these self-serve centers make a switch? What do they need to do to rethink the approach? Well, I got to think about what are the common reasons people are coming to them for service and try to create a more delightful experience. I mean, I, I agree with you in Apple, for example, I mean, I mean, Apple's a bit of a purist company and they're like, 
wow, our phone should be so obvious to use that, right. that you know, I don't need to contact anyone. I don't think that's a great experience. Like, like every once in a while, like I like being delighted. I mean, uh, one of the examples that I think I use this in the book and if I didn't, I'll share it now. But like the first time I like just cut and pasted a FedEx tracking number in Google and it showed me like the tracking information, that was very delightful. I was not <laughs> Like, like, so that's okay to be surprised, but the fact that my iPhone, I have to like swipe or squeeze or tap or like, like just to figure out how to use something like it's super irritating. Right. So, so now I have noticed they have this, like what's new in iOS 14 or what's new. And that's a product led motion to, to help you learn what's new in your software devices. And I think, um, we're starting to see more of that. Like I noticed when I upgraded my, my iPad just last week that it gave me a step-by-step -step guided tour of what, what was in there, meaning it forced me to teach me how to use things. And this was specific in iPad yeah. that now allow you to like do dictation. And honestly, if they didn't educate me, I would have never known. <laughs> so right. I think Apple is changing it. I think they are adding more product-led motions. Um, I think you'll see more of that actually. Well, the Q&A section is, is popping. Keep them coming. Okay. What advice do you have for pure experience companies like law firms, consulting, Uber, Airbnb, Airbnb et cetera? Well, look, I mean, I, I think you're, you're seeing our emerge with like companion apps, other things that, that are delightful. Like, look, if you're a law firm, um, like I want to go on my iPhone and figure out what the heck's happened. I don't have to like send an email and you tell me, oh, this is where we are in our law so like give me some status updates like give me some feedback you know i think this is a great example of just some basic communication creates a better experience for the customer you can do that in an app because like guess what when i want to find out what's going in my lawsuit not, not that i'm in the middle of a lawsuit right now like, <laughs> I, I was gonna say <laughs> like i i want to like i'm probably gonna check in my evening or i'm gonna check on a saturday morning like i'm not gonna check in the middle of the day like i want to be able to go to an app and just understand what the heck's going on so i think all of these um uh, different companies that are typically human driven. There's interesting product led ways. Actually take restaurants. I went to a restaurant the other day and you know, we're all seeing this. I'm assuming we're all seeing this. Like if you're going to a restaurant, um, you're getting these QR codes on your check. So you don't have to like pull out a, like, and I just go online and like maybe use Apple pay. That's delightful. You know, um, wow. It took us like years to get this innovation and rather than like pulling cards out and doing everything else. I mean, not even to bring a card to a restaurant. That's incredibly cool. Um, that's a great way to, you know, kind of blend a both motions. These old QR codes, you know, like that was the thing where I think before I started Pendant many years ago, like, okay, QR codes are going to take off. Well, I was definitely wrong about 15 years ago when, when I thought they were, but sure enough, it just took a pandemic to get these QR codes now like top of mind for all of us. So, um, so I completely agree with you here. I love the idea of like not interacting with humans, but Todd, are you saying that we don't need human connection? We don't need to like meet other humans, interact? Like what, what are you saying? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, look, human interaction, we've all experienced how valuable it is to, to talk with folks. I mean, I want to like get really comfortable with my, my friends, not with a tech support engineer at some Got it. company, right? <laughs> so like there's different styles of human interaction and um, I actually want that to be easier so I can spend more time with my friends um, and loved ones, et cetera. So. That's cool. That's awesome. Okay. Um, you have people beginning to adopt your product, but you want to reduce friction in the opt-in process because the proof is in the pudding. Is the approach to bringing on customers about starting with the why versus the how, is that the right approach? Because expectations still need to be managed. Is that thinking product focused? Yeah. Look, I mean, there's, you know, Simon Sinek, we always know start with why, you know, so I, I think why is um, like, it, at this point, I think we as consumers now like, we're, we're buying brands, we're buying companies, we're buying their vision. I mean, as I always say, when, when people buy Pendo, they're not buying our product as well. I mean, they are buying our product, but they're buying our vision, you know, and the product is the experience that they get when, when they're trying to realize that vision. But you're, 
But that's what the why is. You know, why we exist drives all of our decision making. And why other companies exist should be driving their decision making. You want to partner with something in your life that aligns with the pains that you have. So if a why that a company has aligns with your pains, then it's usually a good fit. So yeah, I think it's an absolutely great way to, to think about things. We always start with why are we doing this? What are the pain points? Um, so yeah. And, and they a follow up on that. So the why persists, but you're not there today. How do you manage that? Well, you're selling a dream and a vision, right? <laughs> Just paint, paint the roadmap of that vision. Like, like, and, and that, that's the great part. Like, if you don't have a great why, but if you just get to it immediately, you want a why that's somewhat aspirational. That'll take a little while for to bring the customer along on this journey. But I think that's okay. I think I, I, you want to have something um, that where you can grow into. Um, from Chris, does Audi and BMW really make better cars than Ford or GM, or are we all just subject to better marketing? Have you driven an Audi? <laughs> Like, I'll never forget, I, 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 so this true story, I, I, I had never owned Audi before. I, I um, thought I was gonna get a different car. I don't know, I went to the dealer, I just by happenstance went, got in and a uh, guy takes me out uh, in a test drive and we got to an on-ramp for off of a highway. And he's like, take it at 45. It's like, excuse me? He's like, I know it says like 35, take it at 45. And what is that doing? He is getting me to an experience the car in a way that someone else wouldn't. And you know what, that thing gripped around that corner. I mean, maybe a little bit of like slide, hooked. Bought the car like 20 minutes later. He Now he knew how to hook me. I wanted a car that moved, <laughs> I wanted a car that handled. But yeah, the, I mean, better? Different is what I would say. I wanted a car that behaved in that way when I turned a corner and he knew that. And and it appealed to my sense of nothing to do with market. I can't even tell you what they market as. I can tell you that the experience of the products drove me to, um, to buy that car. So, so, so yeah, and I, I think there's probably great aspects of Ford and GM that are their differentiators, their special sauce, there's reasons why you do it. Um, I, I don't know necessarily that it's marketing. Um, I mean, so yeah, I don't know, that's, that's my experience with it, so. How, how big of a role does marketing play in a product-led approach? Look, I, 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 think, I, I think less is actually what I think. I think people can see through um, BS now. When we all know reviews exist, so we're looking at things. I think they matter a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, so I mean, marketing's job is to um, get eyeballs to bring someone in, but then it's the product's job to actually do the selling and, and, and you, know, you should be having references. Um, but if we all know that if, a, if marketing outstrips the product, you're gonna get panned. You're like, you say you do this, but you definitely do, don't do it. Like it's not good for you anymore. So, so I, I, I think you need to be um, very, very, very honest. And yeah. um, the more, uh, and honestly, at th this point, the more transparent and authentic you can be, the great, the better the marketing is at this point, in my mind. Like tell the customer, like I, I advocate all the time telling customers like what we're not good at. Mm -hmm. like, if you're really looking for this, don't use us, Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, because you're gonna get a bad experience here. I think that's good marketing. That's really good marketing. So like I'd rather be told not to use something that I'm kind of intrigued actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I think I think a really good ex kind of counterintuitive example of this was like when marketing goes bad with Peloton, uh, when everybody was making fun of that commercial for Christmas, but then people tried the product and they're like, ah, shit, this is good. <laughs> yes. It, look, it was a bit of a controversy. It got people in. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great example. I mean, another great, it's not quite marketing, but uh, uh, it's a product led motion that's sometimes counterintuitive. I talk about this product called superhuman. Some yeah. folks they, they force you to do a human led onboarding call and, and you're thinking to yourself, Oh, how's that product led? And, and then they're almost they're in, and they make you pay before the call, which is like unheard of, uh, in, in this day and age. 
and um, people thought it wouldn't work. Guess what? It works really, really well by telling people, no, they say, they say very specifically, if you're not willing to pay for email, we don't want you as a customer. And then you start thinking to yourself, well, how important is email to me? Maybe I am willing to pay for it. And you start going through those machinations in your head. And truthfully, if you're a customer that just don't care, don't get a lot, like, you know, maybe you shouldn't buy the product. Um, but uh, by doing that, they actually drive a very good experience. And yes, they showed me a few, they showed me I'm a superhuman customer. Um, um, and I was intrigued and they got me kind of hooked. And, and I still think it's a very product, the product, is the experience. Yeah. The fact that they go through like a very quick onboarding, it, it's, I don't know, I, I almost forgot it now, but it was, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, definitely counterintuitive. And it, it's, it's cool because every time I talk to a superhuman user, it's kind of like talking to somebody in a cult. They're, they're just trying to get me in. I'm like, oh, this is a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> um, do you, okay, from Jeffrey, do you have any marketing platforms in mind for tech products that you prefer to get the sales pipeline started? Do I have any marketing platforms in mind for tech products to, uh, I don't know exactly how to answer that. Marketing platform. I mean, like, I mean, look, there's review sites. I've talked a little bit like G2 crowd and companies like that. Trust radius. Those are always good platforms that I think tech products sh should be on. There's other ones as well. And Captera is like more of a old school one as, as well. Um, you know, get good sales pipeline. I mean, nothing like AdWords to drive sales pipeline. Um, so get, get your name out there. And, you know, I think, yeah, the review sites I said are other good ways to get the word out there. Um, the, the New York subway is always a, a great <laughs> marketing. <laughs> yeah, I, I've not done so, I mean, we have done billboards in San Francisco on 101. I've done a variety of other things, depending on your space. Yeah, I, I, actually, billboards are probably really cheap right now at home. So that's cool. Are old line B2B enterprise software companies adapting this product led customer centric approach? Any good examples? You know, good examples. That, that, that's uh, definitely, so the answer is definitely yes. We're seeing this throughout all of our customer base. We work with companies new and old. Um, yeah, let me, let me think through um, uh, some, some good examples. So look, I think, um, you know, we're seeing companies like Salesforce definitely adjust to the way they work, but even like, you know, one of our earlier customers, uh, Infor, so Infor is mm. a, it's a conglomerate of uh, older acquisitions. You know, we part with them uh, a year or so ago on a free trial experience, which is absolutely a product led motion. So that's a, probably a great example of a pretty old school business that's really adjusted. Uh, that's a fascinating business. I wrote about it once. I was like, whoa, how did I not know this existed? Um, well, maybe actually, another one, it's a local example, I guess, thinking about it, is LabCorp. You know, um, I, I, I joke that I, when I, it's not really a joke. It's actually fairly serious. When I got a COVID test in the past few weeks, you go to like patient.labcore.com. We've partnered with them because they weren't expecting all this traffic. Um, we partnered with in-app messaging to help. Okay. If you're getting a COVID test, this is where you go to get your results, blah, blah, blah. So like, like they're a company that's had to adapt very, very fast changing times and using product led techniques. Yeah. Um, this is a good question. What does it take to lead a company through the different stages of growth? Do you think any entrepreneur can do it? Well, that's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> do I think anyone? Probably not any. That's probably not realistic. I mean, I'd like to think I'm pretty, I'm an optimist, like, like almost to a fault, an optimist. Um, what does it take to lead a company to different stages of growth? Um, it takes humility and it takes knowing um, what you're good at and what you're not good at. And it takes letting go. And um, so is it possible that anyone can do it? Yes. What I've seen is most people's personalities and ego get in the way of them doing those things. Ego is like the most dangerous of all of our things. Yes, we need egos to start companies because if you're not confident, you will fail. But if you don't check your ego, like it will kill you. You know, because you'll think you can do everything better than everyone else and you'll never be able to scale and grow the business you want to do. So I think that's, to me, fundamentally the challenge with entrepreneurship. You both need people that are a bit crazy and have large egos, but then also know how to check it. And uh, that's hard. So going off of that question, I have a little bit more of a nuanced uh, question around this. Can you change the culture of a company to a product-led approach one at any time in the company's life cycle, or does it have to have to happen at inception? Absolutely, you can do it at any time, I think. I mean, yeah, certainly at the inception, it's easier to build into the DNA and fabric, but 
um, you know, maybe you can't, maybe you struggle to figure it out and it's not working. And like, look, at some level, entrepreneurship's a game of survival. And if product led isn't working, maybe you should be calling humans up and figuring out how to get them to use your product to like get early product market fit and then later develop it. So, I mean, even, even our journey, Pendo, like, you know, today we actually lost Pendo free. We, we've actually never had a version of a free product or we kind of experimented and everyone's like, oh my gosh, your product led business didn't have a free product. <laughs> no, you know, honestly, when we first started, it just didn't work. No one could figure out what we did. Our marketing copy was just not accurate or good. It was confusing. Um, and then we started, I started personally like selling and calling people and everyone started working, you know, and then we started mm -hmm. growing really fast and then we scaled it. And, um, you know, now as we got into a certain size, our market's much more mature. It's actually easier to do product led now than it was in the early days. So now we're adding, we do other things product led, but we're adding this whole product led growth motion on top of what we already do later. And it's great. I mean, yes, there's some inertia and there's some, you know, I don't like the word politics as much, but you know, you have to you have to align the business around it. But I think it's very, very doable anytime. Cool. Another question: How does empathy play into leading the company? I find that asking more about my employees leads to ownership and buy-in. And in your book, actually, you talk about these things called empathy maps that I thought were interesting. Can you elaborate? Oh, well, look, I think I think empathy is one of the uh, also it's a super key trait. Um, it's hard, but I, I think a lot about. Um, you know, we do these anonymous ask me anything questions. Um, we do them every other week in our town hall and we get some doozies of questions, like really doozy, especially now it's all work from home. It's like, are you like, I got a question. Like, are you trying to kill us by like, Oh God, know, <laughs> having people come or something. You get, you get some very extreme questions. It's like, um, and the easy reaction when you get this question is to get angry and said, I can't believe this person's asking this question. Don't they know who we are? Do we stand for that? Like, but you can't get angry because then you have to put yourself in that person's shoes and well, what are they hearing from other family members? Maybe they're living with someone at risk. What are they experiencing? So empathy maps is a way to like force yourself to think about the various senses of the user you're talking with, the person you're talking with. Like, What's the environment they're in? What are they hearing? Um, what are they thinking or what do you think that they're thinking? And by understanding those things, it, it actually helps you understand how to deal with it a lot better. So I, I, I think empathy has been one of the things that uh, I've used as a tool to honestly calm me down, slow me down. Um, you know, I realize that, you know, uh, actually for some of our employees, it's their first job ever. Yeah. And we are like an incredibly fast growth company where there is a ton of change. Like I'm completely willing to make crazy changes any week of the year. And then some people just aren't good with change. So like, and I'll have to tell them like every other week, Hey, change is normal. Change is constant. Cause guess what? They're not used to that. Their, their backgrounds, their experiences to date aren't the same as mine. So my job is to educate, to teach, to remind, um, and so I, when I put myself in those shoes, like, I, you know, every once in a while, like, well, how did I think when I was 20 and had an experience? <laughs> well, yeah, this would have been a little jarring for me. Okay, well, that's fair. Well, okay, let's, let's help them through it. So yeah, I think empathy is really the key. Empathy maps are great. Um, I mean, it's really, it's, I mean, product managers, we get, we're trained to do these sorts of things. And I think my background as a product manager probably has helped me as an entrepreneur and, and leader. Yeah. Um, Chris asks, Netflix just quietly canceled their free 30 day trial. Oh, I did not know that. Trend setting or mistake? I guess we'll see, right? <laughs> doing. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I, one of my favorite books recently was the No Rules Rules book from, from, uh, from Netflix on their culture. And you know, mm -hmm. they have done a masterful job of like navigating multiple cultural trends of going obviously to the, the DVD business, to the, to the streaming business, to now more of a content business. Um, uh, I, I think it obviously could be trend setting. You know, um, um, here, here's the thing, like, so why do you buy Netflix now? Why do you watch it? Um, you, you watch it because they have some unique content that they and only they have, like, like, like The Crown, Schitt's Creek, um, that Queen's Gambit show is ridiculously good. All the new um, Christmas movies. I got you. <laughs> Christmas movies, yeah. But, but, 
if they had a 30 day trial and people now binge watch, you could binge watch it, cancel, and then jump to another service. Well, maybe you want to go to Disney plus and watch Hamilton or something like that. Right? So I think the content is of high enough quality and it's well enough known that the contents, potentially the product it's selling itself. You don't need people to try it. Like people like, like how many, uh, Emmys has the queen or, or the crown one tons. Trust me, watch it. It's fantastic. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's actually pretty smart. It's probably a good test. We'll, we'll see, we'll see what works. I mean, like, like you need to try Netflix. Everyone knows what Netflix is. Right. Right. Um, we have a follow up on the empathy question. Does everyone in the company need to be empathy focused internal and external to truly understand your customer's experience and pain? <laughs> need. Um, uh, needs the keyword and like need i mean of course not you're not i mean good luck with that you're not gonna like ever find um everyone even capable of that i think it's hard for people to be empathetic um it's really hard um i think everyone should strive to be empathetic they should try to be empathetic surely with customers to drive a better experience um and each other you know how many times do you have conflict within your organization and if just if one person was the only person's shoes like it would be quickly settled and resolved like all the time so i think we all as humans can do a better job being empathetic i don't know that any of us need it to be successful there's plenty of successful humans that have been not empathetic um uh but i think it certainly makes the world a better place so like yeah i would I, it, it's a nice to have um so when i was reading your book you talk a lot about feedback how do you turn feedback into action that drives value? And it might be a little bit easier when you're a smaller company, but what about when you scale? Yeah, well, I, I think um, it is easier in your small companies. So you're just trying to, you know, I, was, uh, you know, I was sharing recently that, you know, if you've got almost no customers and you just need a customer and the customer says, do this, you know, it's a good chance doing this is the right answer for the business. Yeah. Um, but when you have thousands of customers, it gets a lot harder. And, and there, look, I mean, uh, I think um, there's a little bit of art and science here. Uh, I'm a big advocate of creating um, systems, um, scoring methodologies. Um, so first off is, you know, having some unified system for capturing that feedback, trying to create some scoring you know, scoring methodology around it, where we're looking at you know, various ways. I, like in the book, I talk about a variety of different ways to score work you know, in terms of the business value that it's adding. But I would, I, I think conceiving of some scheme is, is the right way to parse through it. I think it's the only way I've seen it work at scale. Now, some people will say, well, is there a real art in that? Now, some companies will still have some, you know, innovation or entrepreneur edge where like you just get a lot of conviction around something and um that's okay i mean that, that there's still plenty of room for that but um in that case maybe you take whatever you're working on and building and say okay 80 percent of what we're going to do fits the scoring methodology and we're going to use all this feedback and it's going to be organized and we can use internal and external feedback and weight it then 20 percent we're going to leave for like moonshot projects mm. And that's totally okay. And I think you still need some moonshot, like experimental things, things that like things that you know aren't working unless a bunch of those ideas fail. And you saw that with like Google X, right? Uh, I think it's called X or something like that. They're the, yeah, the moonshot, yeah. They're moonshots. Yeah. Like I think every company, when you get to a certain scale, needs to be thinking about um, another way of thinking about moonshots, like Horizon 3 initiatives, which are like three to five year initiatives. We all should be taking a few risks. You know, because in order to maintain growth and continue scaling, like, you have to have a few things that represent the future. And I think you you should always be like prioritizing those things. And those things are hard to measure. Those things you don't want a framework around. They're 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 art. They're inspiration. They're innovation. So like I think you need to blend both. Okay, so that's interesting. You talked about the importance of data earlier. How do you measure success in a product led company? Well, look, I I. I think one of, the, one of the book chapters is called "Start with the End in Mind." So I think it, it like success is de, is defined upon the stage of the business and what you're trying to accomplish. So, a, you know, if you're a startup and trying to get the product market fixed, success may be ten reference customers. Mm -hmm. If you're a growth business, well, obviously it's growth. If you're a more established business and like you're focused, maybe you're private equity owned, and like you know, EBITDA is the measure that you that your investors and team really cares about, then that's the measure of success. So I think 
every business has a different outcome for success. Um, uh, the key is then trying to find the leading indicators, things that, that are driving those outcomes. Um, so you can actually manage, manage according to it. And I think that's actually the, the harder point is like, like, like I can, let's say I measure growth rate. By the time I find out what my growth rate is, it's kind of late. Um, yeah. um, versus, um, uh, you know, I want leading indicators so I actually can manage the business more effectively. So like, those are the things that I, I try to spend more of my time. So if growth is the lagging indicator, what are the things that I can see well in advance of that rate that I can turn dials and knobs and things like that, so. Got it. So, okay, so uh, data is important. You talk about that, but also in the book, you talk about, uh, you emphasize the human aspect of software. What are some practical ways that product managers or executives or entrepreneurs can master the human side of their product? Um, well, look, I, in the book, I talk a lot about qualitative uh, surveys as well. Um, you know, you, you can um, obviously, you know, things like net promoter score. I, I actually, I probably introduced way too many, um, like simple usability score, you know, customer effort score. I, I have like four or five of those in the book. So these are all ways that kind of measure the humans uh, experience with your software and structured methodologies. I think those are pretty good ways to do it. You can look at, um, Funnel analysis, which is humans completing tasks inside mm. your product and look at conversion rates of those. That's something I like to do very, very often. Um, I even, uh, you know, there's also technologies out there for watching videos of customers and understanding what people are doing. I mean, that, that I mean, videos isn't necessarily scale. Like you can watch like a handful of videos before like mind numbing, but you can watch a handful of key ones and then to kind of help, um, Again, that's, that's actually another way of gaining empathy by watching someone use your product. And sometimes if it's painful, that's a great thing. Like and as a, <laughs> the leader of your org, if you find one of those, take that and send it to every leader in your company. It's like, this is what our users are experiencing. And then that, that tugs at the heart and the emotions. And then we're like, oh, that feels bad. We got to go fix that, right? So um, yeah, that up another book. I, I, I love that book. You know, switch. You, get, you read that book mm -hmm. from the Heath brothers. They talk about the brain having these two aspects, this rider and this elephant. You, you know oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know the metaphor. <laughs> yeah. So I like to find ways, and that's all about driving change inside your brain, of like tapping into the elephant. Tapping into the elephant is taking some video of some user, like painfully using your product and sending them in your company. Because then it'll, like, it'll listen to motion. Now, the, the rider will see the funnel conversion rates and see, okay, well, technically we have, you know, less than 5%. So you need both to inject change. And I think both are great ways to, to do that. Based on everything you've worked on and done and seen, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you think product managers and entrepreneurs make in the process of becoming a product led company? Um, that's a good question. Mistakes. Um, well, look, I, I, I think they have two narrow views of product led. I, I, I think this whole like we, you know, if I'll hear people say, well, our sales team won't let us be product led. Well, our sales team has nothing to do with your support team. Mm. So like, like, like everyone goes to this whole growth angle and they immediately start there. They think, oh, we can't do free because no one will let us. So they, they get very defeatist around the whole notion, which, you know, I think the, the key is find areas of your business where you can be product led. And I think often I see people just think too narrowly. I, I shared an example recently of um, product led recruiting where, and this may get a little technical for the audience, so I apologize, but like in a, in a web browser, you can like look at the code of the web page. I mean, I'll, trust me, this is possible. Um, and one of the products that I used once, I went to go do this just, I don't know, it was for curiosity. And it had this thing, this like message like, hey, if you're looking at this, you may be a good candidate to work at our company apply here for jobs. That's product led recruiting. That's really, really cool. You know, because only a developer would look at that thing and I was using the product. And so obviously I liked the product or maybe it's not obvious, but I, I was using it. I liked it. And now they're trying to find like developers who are like, that's cool. That's creative. That that's so like, don't constrain your thinking into product led. I mean, there's lots of ways you can do things. I think that's probably the biggest, um, Failure, I see. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, again, a reminder, if you have questions, put them in the chat um, so I can ask Todd. Okay, um, has the product management 
playbook changed at all during COVID? Um, and how has it affected the customer experience in some cases? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, obviously, we've seen this rapid acceleration of digital transformation. You know, I think Satya Nadella said that we saw, I don't know, like, two years of digital transformation compressed into 90 days. So, so I think, so all of us are now finding like ways in which we can use the product for, for more product led motions. I mean, I think a great example that, that I have been highlighting recently is toast. I mean, been a, been a restaurant, like it's all curbside thing. Like that was, they didn't have, I mean, toast was a point of sale system. It's meant for basically restaurateurs in restaurants, not for like consumers coming and ordering a lot of things. So they've had to pivot and adjust their model and do it in a time where like their industry is being impacted. So they've had fewer uh, employees, frankly, to, to service their customers. So they've had to employ, employ product led techniques to, to, um, to think about their business. They have to shift their priorities. And I've seen a lot of product managers shift what they work on in COVID from you know, everything pre COVID was very much growth, 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 growth. And I saw a rapid shift to retain, 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 retain. You know, how do we help our customers weather the storm? Um, you know, and another great example is we work a lot with um, HR tech companies, people do payroll benefits. I mean, think about the, the, the change in HR. There's first, there's just like all like the loans and the deferment of all the you know, payroll taxes. And then you have things like wellness all of a sudden has become like some thing that we talk about, like, like wellness always existed, but we never talked about it. Now we talk about it all the time, like mental health. Like I, I've used that term more in the last six months and in, in my entire life. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it matters. I mean, like, let's be honest, it matters. And, and um, I think, those product managers have to completely shift their roadmaps. Like we need to develop mental health features, not like, you know, uh, you know, if you're an HR tech, you probably shift your focus from recruiting because people are recruiting less to mental health. How do we keep the people we have like sane, you know? Yeah. So, uh, what do you, what do you think about this new trend of like the quantified self where it's, you know, you're measuring your glucose levels. There are startups that are measuring like literally everything going on in your body and like your sleep and all that stuff. Um, is the, in terms of a product led approach, like it's, it's yourself. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. You know, I, I, now I'm a, you are the product. <laughs> I'm a data nerd, so it's like it's like you're asking an engineer if they like. Of course, I like the quantified self. Yeah, I, mean, um, I I think it's um, really interesting. And you know, I, I, Brad Feld was an investor in my last company. Cool. Um, and Brad was an early investor in Fitbit, and he 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 once described to me like why he invested in Fitbit. He's like, look. Um, I think the future is our entire bodies are going to be completely measured. And this is version 1.0 of it. That was his thesis of why he invested in it, which is, if you think about it, pretty genius. <laughs> yeah. He's a very good investor. Um, and I, and I, I think about that and we're seeing more and more of it. I think the most interesting thing about COVID here is that I used to travel so much. I could never keep up with any of these challenges or like numbers telling me things. I'd be like in a different airport or I'd show up at a hotel and they wouldn't have a gym and, <laughs> or, you know, like, um, uh, like I, I never got into a groove where I started like winning to start building on my successes as my quantified self. But COVID has allowed us all to slow down enough. We can just focus on ourselves. You know, it's like, like I look at, you know, there's three legs of our, our human stool, at least for me it is. It's like, it's like work, you know, family, and then self. And I've always been pretty good of managing work and family, like prioritizing those two. I mean, my family may disagree sometimes, but I, <laughs> I job. But self always got the short end of the stick. And not traveling, like being forced to stay put has allowed me to, um, invest in that self. Now the question is, when things do go back to normal, I think they'll go back to a more normal, how do I keep a focus on self? And how do I leverage this quantified self? How do I look, look back at the numbers I did and say, okay, which one of these things I did made me feel the best? Right. Like was the best, and, and then maybe I'll focus my energies on those things rather than focus just broadly on everything. So, um, so we'll see. And then I think the other thing is driven is it, it's driven more efficiencies. You know, like I now have both not only Peloton, but a tonal and we've got all these things. And, and 
So like I save time. Like I go to my home gym, I come back. I just, I just, you know, netted um, minutes and time. And yeah, that's probably not good for gym owners out there. So I apologize if we have that call, but um, um, I think it's ultimately very, very good. And yeah, our body is a product and yeah. our life is a product. And if you're not healthy, I think we also, the other thing is we all appreciate is our health. We took for granted. Like you cannot take that for granted. You, your, your impact on the world is going to be obviously affected by your, your stay on it. So to take care of your body so you stay on it for as long as possible to have the greatest impact. It's really that simple. That's awesome. Um, we had a um, question from the audience earlier. Your experiences in software solutions, what advice would you offer a hardware company where creating hydrogen using electromagnetic waves, proof of concept, patents granted, scaling up presently? Well, well, smarter than me. That's a, uh, <laughs> Same. <laughs> okay. I, um, look, I, I think, I think, well, I mean, advice I have, I mean, I, I think if, if you're talking specifically that's constrained to product led, you know, and I, I talked a little bit about, you know, is there other software aspects of what we've seen now in the hardware world in the last, you know, 10 years is this shift towards more commodity hardware and more differentiation through software because software is more adaptive. So is there a software component to making hydrogen? I have no idea. I'm just um, brainstorming here, but I, I you know, I, we've seen this play now and that's obviously where all the smartphones have gone, but all the technology is going that way where everything is becoming this like commodity oriented device, which is very general purpose. And then a lot of differentiations coming in software. So I yeah. think thinking through that is what I would be thinking about. All right. So my final question for you um, is you've launched several companies from scratch. What have been the three most important lessons you've learned from those experiences? Um, the three most important things about launching three companies from scratch. Um, look, I, I think um, hire amazing people. Like it's easy to, to not do that. Um, and when I say hire amazing people, everyone you get involved with, including your investors and everything else, like surround yourself with great people. So that, that's probably the first thing. Early in my career, I think I used to think, oh, money's money. It doesn't really matter who you raise money from. It actually does. It does a lot. <laughs> um, wrong answer earlier um, so so focus on, on who you surround yourself obsess over a great product um, I think in earlier startups I I put on some milestone chart oh ship product sell product like assuming it would be like that magical like no you have to obsess on it iterate on it um, uh, so, so that that that's the second thing and then the third thing is really invest in culture so mm. um, how do you thing. invest in culture um, I think the first thing is to define what, what you want out of your culture and the way you define that is by setting some sort of values. Like this is what we stand for and this is what we mean. I, I, I think um, if you define a set of values and make them um, non-negotiables. Like, mm. This is how we behave. Um, non-negotiable. Um, I think that's where you start with culture. That's very cool. Okay. I, I have a hundred more questions, but this has been fabulous. Thank you so much, Todd. <laughs> Oh, that was awesome, guys. I I have not enjoyed uh, such a real conversation um, in a, in quite some time. So thank you to both of you, uh, Todd. I just want to give a shout out to your team, uh, Laura specifically, who helped us bring all this together and make it happen, and and of course Polina for your availability and willingness awesome. to sit with Todd. Uh, a lot of good nuggets here. Um, I went ahead and copied all the questions uh, in the chat so we can share those for those that missed it and we'll, we'll release this out on YouTube. Just uh, a, fa a few last points. Obviously we want everyone to enjoy their free book on behalf of uh, Pendo, the first hundred uh, did get a free book. So if you can do us a favor and go write a review for Todd, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. We'd, we'd like to have him keep sharing his strategies and philosophies. So a little encouragement goes a long way. Um, Polina, thank you so much uh, again. And we want you all to follow her and sign up for the profile. I've enjoyed it. Uh, 
usually over my cup of coffee uh, on the weekends. Um, you can find that at theprofile.substack.com uh, and we'll follow up with an email on that so you all can get signed up. Lastly, I would um, not do, be doing CED a disservice if I didn't talk a little bit about Venture Connect uh, and our intentions around having these exact types of conversations this year. Uh, we have to be virtual again, which is unfortunate, but we are pulling together some really exciting topics uh, with founders um, that will help others grow and, and continue to scale their company. So we really hope that you'll join us for that March 23rd through the 25th. If you're looking to be on stage, applications are open until December 18th. Don't forget to throw your hat in the ring on that. Visit us on our website, cednc.org. So thank you all for coming. Uh, this was great. Thanks again to our presenters um, and conversationalists. We really enjoyed the session. Hope you guys all have a great day and be well. I learned a lot. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> yeah. Bye.